quite a bit about prime numbers, but we definitely don't know everything. For example, uh, we've got a pretty good idea of how they're distributed, and that's what this statement here is telling us. Uh, this pi of n, this is what's called the prime counting function, and it equals the number of prime numbers less than or equal to n. So what this is saying is that the number of prime numbers less than or equal to n is proportional to n divided by the log of n. On the other hand, we don't know where the actual numbers are. There is no formula that we can use to calculate, for example, the millionth prime number, or even just the next prime number if you've, if you've got one to start with. Now, we've actually already seen a statement about how these numbers are distributed. That was Euclid's statement that there are infinitely many primes. Just knowing that there are infinitely many of them tells us uh, that there is no upper bound. Right? If you pick any number, there's always going to be a prime number greater than it. So in this lecture, we're going to look at two theorems that give us uh, information about how prime numbers are distributed, and they give us a, a practical tool for determining the prime factorization of a number. So the theorem here may, may seem a little fussy, a little obvious at first, but it's the kind of thing that mathematicians worry about. Right? Before we can talk about writing the prime factorization of a number, we first have to ask ourselves, can we be sure that every number even has a prime factorization? Well, this theorem is, is a first step in that direction. Right now, to prove this, <clears throat> we're going to use a new method called proof by cases. Right? The logical form for this is P and Q. P implies R, Q implies R, therefore R, right? Now, it, in practice, what this means is that if, if we can split our situation up into multiple cases, that's the P and the Q here, and show that some conclusion, that's R, is true, for all of those individual cases, then it must always be true. All right, so in this case, uh, we're going to have two cases, right? The first case, call this case one, is the case where n is prime, and case two is the opposite, is the case where n is Composite, right? Not prime. All right, case one, and this is actually a trivial case. If n is prime, then we're done, right? Then every number is divisible by itself, and because n is prime, that meets the requirements, right? And we're, and we're finished. Now, if n is composite, then what happens, right? Well, being composite means that I can write this as the product of two smaller numbers, right? Two smaller integers. So n is composite implies there exists two integers, let's call them p1 and q1, such that n is equal to their product, right? And what, what do I know about these numbers? Well, I, I know, and I'm, I'm right, I'm, I'm going to focus on the P's. You can make the same argument about the Q's, right? But I'm only going to need to think about one of them to get to my point. So I know that um, P1 is greater than 1 and less than n. If, if it were equal to n, then that would be case 1, and, we'd be, and we've, we've done that already. And if it was equal to 1, then Q1 would have to be equal to n, and again, that would be the prime number that we're looking for. Okay, so we're going to do the same two cases again, right? If P1 is prime, then we're done. P1 divides n, right? This, this n equals P1 times Q1. This means P1 divides n. So if P1 is prime, 
then we're finished, right? If P1 is not prime, then do this again, right? If P1 is not prime, then there exists integers P2 and Q2 such that P1 is equal to P2 times Q2. All right, now, again, right, let, let's, let's, be, let's fit this into our, my inequality here, right, because it's going to be a key part of this. P2 has to be greater than 1, right, so 1 is less than P2, but P2 has to be less than P1. See, I, I'm kind of just extending my inequality here, All right? Now, again, same situation holds, right? If um, P2 is prime, then because P2 divides P1 and P1 divides N, this is that transitive property we were talking about earlier. Right? If P2 is, divides P1 and P1 divides N, then P2 divides N. And if P2 is prime, then we're home free. Right? That's the number we were looking for. Right? Again, what if it's not? All right? What if it's not? Then we, we do this again. Right? And we do it again and again and again and again. And we end up with this sequence of numbers. Right? 1 is less than... P sub K is less than P K minus 1 is less than all the way up to P2, P1, and N. Now, here's where things get interesting. Right? This sequence of, of P's, it has to end. Right? It has to end. There, there are a finite number of integers between... 1 and n. So eventually we're, we're going to get to a P sub k that and, and we can't go any further. right? And what does it mean to not be able to go any further? Well, it means that that P sub k cannot be broken down, if you will. It, it can't be rewritten as the product of two smaller numbers. Well, if P sub k can't be written as the product of two smaller numbers, then that means it must be prime. And if P sub K is prime, then that's the number that I wanted, right? And that proves the theorem, right? So let, let, let's see if I can't if I can't write this out here, right? The sequence P sub K, whoops, uh, P sub K p sub k minus 1, so on, up to p2, and p1 has to be finite, right? That is, there had, there, it has to end. There, there has to be a final number in the list. That final number, the last value will be, excuse me, will be greater than 1 and can't be written as the product of two smaller integers. Therefore, P sub K is prime, and that's the number that we need, right? That's the number that the theorem says must exist. So this theorem here is uh, kind of the more practical of the two. Uh, when I, when I'm, you're teaching students to find the prime factorization of a number, it's very brute force. You just take your number, you start dividing it by prime numbers, and you see which ones work and which ones don't. Right, so if I want to find the prime factorization of 282, for example, I would start by factoring out a 2, 
as two times 141 and uh, 141. Does two go into it? No. So I'm done with the twos. Does three go into it? Well, yeah, actually it does. So then I, I you know, you just keep going with this. Two times three times whatever. Um, uh, 47, I think. And uh, you, you just keep going, right, until you, you're down to nothing but prime numbers. Um, so when I, when I do this, a question that I often get asked is, well, how do I know when I can stop? You know, do I really need to check every number between 2 and 281, or, or is there an upper limit? Well, yeah, there is, and that's what this theorem is, is telling us. All right, so um, how can we see that this is true? Well, we know that n is composite, right, because n is composite. There exist integers a and b such that uh, a times b equals n. Okay. Now, at least one of a and b has to be less than the square root of n. All right. Let me write that. At least one of a and b must be less than the square root of n. All right, and th th think about why. If they were both greater than the square root of n, then when you multiply them together, their product would be greater than the square root of n times the square root of n, which is n, and their product can't be greater than n, right? It equals n. All right, so at least one of them must be less than the square root of n. Let A be that one. Doesn't matter which, which one you pick, right? So let A be less than the square root of n. Now, think back to the theorem we just talked about, right? That, that theorem says that every integer greater than one is divisible by a prime number. Okay, so theorem 3. Point, this is 3.6, so the last one was 3.5, says that A must be divisible by some prime number P, right, and that's what I needed. And again, we're we're going to use that trans that, that transitive property is really cool, right? We get we get a lot of mileage out of that, right? P divides A, and we saw up here, right? A divides N, therefore P divides N, and P is the prime divisor that we were looking for. So I, I did gloss over one point that I want to go back uh, and, and mention here, right? Um, our theorem says that A uh, must be divisible by a prime number if it's greater than 1. And uh, hopefully you, you realize this, but A is greater than 1, right? If A was equal to 1, then jump back up to here. If A was equal to 1, then B is equal to N. And that's not what it means to be composite, right? To be composite, uh, it, we have to be able to write n as two, the product of two numbers other than 1 and n, right? So, yeah, that a does, in fact, have to be greater than 1. Okay, so let, let's see how, how we can use this, because it's not immediately obvious, I don't think, um, how this, this tells us where to stop. Right, so let, let's say, for example, uh, we're, we're trying to find the prime factorization of 822. Right, I'm just picking a number here. N equals 822. Right. This says, the theorem says N is composite. If N is composite, then it has a prime divisor less than this thing. And that, that's great, but that's really not what I was looking for. I was looking for an upper bound. How do I know when to stop? Right when I'm when I'm doing that division to to find prime divisors. Now remember, 
right, remember, going back to our discussion of, of, of propositional logic, a propositional, uh, a conditional statement and its contrapositive are equivalent. Right? In a certain sense, they, they mean the same thing. Right, so by by proving that this was true, we kind of got another theorem for free. Right, we also know that the contrapositive of this must be true. Right, and the contrapositive of this, remember how we do that? We we flip the two parts, so the the n is a composite integer. The if part becomes the then, and the then part becomes the if. So this is going to go over here has a prime divisor, this is going to come over here, and we do the negation of both of them. Right, so has a prime divisor becomes does not have a prime divisor, and n is composite becomes n is not composite, but not composite is the same as prime. Right? So we, we get this, I, I just call this version 2, this is actually the contrapositive. If a does not have, excuse me, that should be n, whoops, if n does not have a prime divisor less than or equal to the square root of n, then n is prime. Right? So this is the one that's giving me my upper bound. Right? Again, let's say um, I'm trying to find the prime factorization of 82 when I'm wondering, well, is it prime? Where, where can I stop? Well, this is saying you have to check all the integers between 1 and and the square root of 822, which my calculator says is 28.67. So you have to check everything between 1 and 29. If n does not have a prime divisor in that range, then n is prime. It doesn't have any prime, it doesn't have any prime divisors, and you're finished. Okay, so what's next? Now, now that we've got these tools in hand, uh, we're ready to talk about uh, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, right? And we'll, we'll see how that's going to help us out um, to, to answer not only number theory questions, but applied questions related to things like computer science.